Hi, my name is Vivid, and I've been interested in various Pokemon challenge runs for a while now. I even did an entire live stream series here on YouTube where I played through Pokemon Crystal without ever taking damage, and that was a blast. I've seen a lot of these hardcore Nuzlocks from creators like Flygon HG and Self Spectre pop into my recommendations lately, and after binging some of those videos, I was hooked. I had to try one of these runs. For those who are unaware, a hardcore variant plays by the standard rules of a Nuzlocke, those being that you can only catch the first Pokemon on a route, if a Pokemon faints it is considered dead and must be released, and you must nickname your Pokemon to form an emotional bond, but in addition to those rules, you must also play the entire game on the set battle style, meaning you cannot switch when you knock out a trainer's Pokemon, and you cannot level up over the highest level of the next gym leader's Pokemon, and you cannot use any items inside battle except for held items. It's basically a Nuzlocke, just more hardcore. While preparing for this challenge, I also stumbled across a video from Small Ant where he played through an entire game without ever clicking an attacking move. How did he do this, you might ask? Well, in Pokemon games, there are three types of moves. Physical attacks, special attacks, and status moves. Physical and special attacks are moves like Close Combat and Thunderbolt that do direct damage to the opponent. Moves like Leech Seed and Poison Powder will still do damage over time, but are status moves. While the damage output is typically slower, it is possible to KO every Pokemon without ever attacking. This got me thinking, how hard would it be to marry these two ideas? This video is me finding out. Can I beat a hardcore Nuzlocke on Pokemon Soul Silver without ever clicking an attacking move? I decided on the Gen 2 remakes pretty early on, mostly because I love Johto, but they also seem to be amongst the easier games I could try this challenge on, and I'll take any advantage I can get. I also decided Soul Silver would be the version I played because of version exclusives. So I loaded up a copy of Soul Silver, named my character Vivid, and went straight to the lab to pick up a Chikorita. This start is already going to make the game a little bit more difficult because later in the game Typhlosion will likely be pretty good against some of my better encounters, but I think the early game of this challenge would be exponentially harder with any other starter. I named the Chikorita subscribe, and if you enjoy this content I think you should definitely subscribe, and also consider leaving a like. Both of those things help out a ton and mean the absolute most to me. I got all of the intro nonsense out of the way and realized I was going to have to throw the first battle. I didn't have any way to gain levels at this point during the game, at least I didn't think I did. Either way, most people don't consider the challenge of a Nuzlocke as a officially started until you get Pokeballs anyway, so I was okay conceding this battle. I go report to Elm, who I guess just let a child overpower him and steal a super valuable and rare Pokemon, and I tell him that the thief's name is 97%, since something like 97% of the people watching my videos aren't subscribed. I guess the message here is subscriber I'll fight you, I, I don't know, it made sense at the time. I unlock Pokeballs and head straight into the first route only to realize there isn't a single encounter in that area that really benefits me at all, at least not until much later in the game. While there is something to be said just for having extra bodies, I want to be efficient. It's at this point I decide I will like need to play with some exceptions to the hardcore rules to make this challenge not only playable but enjoyable. First exception. There are too many Pokemon in this game that would be little more than a body in this challenge since their move pulls don't offer much in the way of status moves. And again, while extra bodies might come in handy at times, it would not be a super fun viewing experience and it wouldn't be enjoyable for me to play. I decided to give myself 5 rerolls in each area so that I could at least try to target specific Pokemon. I know this is directly breaking one of the set in stone Nuzlocke rules, so if you think that's awful, just let me know. Please leave any mean comments in the comment section down below. Those help with the algorithm, so I'm all for them. I might even heart your mean comments. I also decided to treat TMs in this game like you would in Gen 5 and beyond, meaning once I've obtained a TM, it is unlocked and I can use it indefinitely after that. I know this isn't really an exception to the Nuzlocke rules, but it's something I wanted to get out of the way and explain now so there aren't questions about it later. Those are the only special rules I'll be playing with, so now it's time to start getting levels. You're probably wondering how I managed to train it all at this point. Not a single Pokemon I have access to right now has any damaging status moves, and I can't move on without fighting trainers. Well, it's simple. And by simple, I mean absolutely mind-numbing. I make my way to Route 30 and catch a Ladybug. I decide on naming all the Pokemon in this run after the comments on my recent videos, so I name her Brooke. Leave a comment, who knows, maybe we'll be picked for a name for the next challenge. Now Ladybug and Ladian are normally really terrible Pokemon, but they actually have a pretty good move pool for this challenge, so I'm excited to do at least try it. Having a second Pokemon unlocks my singular viable way of getting experience right now. Also on Route 30, there is a 10% chance to encounter Kakuna that only know Harden. By switching in and out over and over again until the Kakuna runs out of Harden PP and has to struggle, it will knock itself out from recoil. This is painfully slow, but it's a reliable way to get XP, and the defense EVs might come in handy later. It's at this point I realize I could have leveled up subscribe alone since Growl has 10 more power points than Harden, but let's all pretend we don't know that. I take a break out of sheer boredom to go grab a Geodude from Route 46 that I named Greg. Geodude doesn't really learn any great status moves, but it does have a good defense stat and valuable resistances for the early part of this game, so I decide it's worth it. I then head back and force Kakuna to KO themselves until Subscribe reaches level 9. That's the level that Chikorita learns Poison Powder at, which is my first real way to actually do any damage. I move on getting the mandatory battles out of the way and grab some more encounters. I catch a Bellsprout on Route 31 and name it Lunar. 
a ghastly and sprout tower which I named Toxic, and I somehow find the incredibly rare Dunsparce within my 5 rerolls in Dark Cave and name it after my friend Root, mostly because Zubat is a common encounter here and I know it will bug him that I name a Dunsparce after him rather than a Zubat which evolves into one of his favorite Pokemon Crobat. Another quick side note on Root, he does a ton of competitive battles on his channel, so if that's your sort of thing you should definitely check him out, I'll put his link in the description down below. And finally, I finished my encounters by finding an Ekans which amazingly has Intimidate. I would like to note here that I'm not allowing myself to reroll for abilities, so on this route if the first Ekans I had found had Shed Skin instead of Intimidate. I would have been forced to catch that one. Luckily, I got Intimidate, and this is absolutely one of the best abilities I can have for this point in the game. I named the Ekans Code, and after leveling up some of the new members, I'm ready to take on the Gym Trainers for additional XP. Or so I thought. It turns out in the remakes, you can't skip Sprout Tower, which throws a pretty big wrench in my plan, since my main form of damage right now is Poison Powder, and a lot of the trainers in Sprout Tower use, shockingly, Bell Sprout. And Bell Sprout cannot be poisoned since it's part poison type. After planning for a little bit, I decide on a strategy of abusing Code's Intimidate plus Toxic Spite to quickly run all the Bell Sprout out of PP to force them into a quicker struggle. While I'm doing this, Toxic also hits level 12, which unlocks a new way of doing damage in Curse. It's a risky move to click because it takes half my HP away, but it's a great way to speed up battle since Curse does double the damage that Poison does at the end of a turn. It also gives me a way to damage Poison and Sill types which I genuinely don't have right now, so that's neat. I finish up in Sprout Tower and head straight to the gym. I take out the gym trainers easily enough, and I think I have a decent plan for Faulkner. I lead off with Code to get an Intimidate off, and then I abuse Code's Intimidate plus Greg's Typing to switch in and out until Pidgey has negative 6 attack. Is this overkill? Yes, absolutely, but I'm trying to be cautious. I bring in Subscribe to poison it, and then it's just a waiting game at that point. The Pidgey goes down, and then Faulkner sends out Pidgeotto. I start the switch shenanigans again, but Pidgeotto actually knows Gust. This is not ideal, since Gust is a special attack, so it won't actually be affected by Intimidate. At this point, I make what I think now is a pretty big mistake, and I glare the Pidgeotto with Code. This means I won't be able to poison it, and I'll have to find another way to whittle it down. I honestly don't know why in the moment I thought this was a good plan, but I have to move forward with it. I switch into Brook knowing I can tank two Gusts, and I go for a Supersonic, and I actually manage to land it. Now that Pidgeotto is paralyzed and confused, its chances of actually attacking are much less. I switch into Ghastly and the Pidgeotto breaks through and hits a Gust for 10 damage. I have to curse here and just hope that the Pidgeotto hits itself or gets fully paralyzed, but it is not. It snaps out of confusion and after my curse takes out Toxic with a Gust. I feel like this is pretty poor play on my part since I should have at least tried to poison with Subscribe who could take one non-critical hit Gust. I don't know how different the fight would have gone, but I might still have Toxic. Rest in peace friend, you did well. The Pidgeotto keeps spamming Roost as it gets low, but eventually it gets fully paralyzed twice in a row and falls to the curse. Badge 1 is mine, and with it I unlock the TM for Roost, which is actually pretty valuable since I can't use healing items in battle. Before I make my way to Azalea, I get the Mystery Egg from Elm's Aid and immediately box it. Togepi might be useful later, but it's not right now. En route to Azalea, Subscribe evolves into a Bayleaf, meaning it's a pretty bulky boy now, and I catch a Zubat in Union Cave, also naming it Root, since again, Crobat's one of his favorites. I then catch a Hopip, and I name it Scream. Hopip is a Pokemon I'm actually really excited for if it can stick around, because its level up moveset is perfect for a challenge like this and it's something I've never used. Entering Azalea City, I see Kurt trying to single-handedly defeat Team Rocket, and I decide honestly, I don't care. I go try to take on the gym trainers for some experience, but surprise, I cannot. I guess I have to go help Kurt. Now the Slowpoke well actually presents another challenge for me because a lot of the Rocket Grunts use poison type Pokemon, and I don't have Toxic anymore to curse them. I go in with a completely ridiculous strategy of lowering each poison type's defense with Leer, and then confusing them with either Brook or Root Supersonic. If you don't know, when you hit yourself in Confusion, it's calculated as a typeless physical move that has a base power of 40. So by lowering their defense, they'll hit themselves harder. This strategy is completely insane since it's entirely RNG based and Supersonic is only 55% accurate, but I managed to make it through. Brooke is really starting to prove herself as an asset here because she's learned Safeguard, Reflect, and Light Screen while leveling up. So she essentially provides all the defensive utility I could want, preventing status conditions and halving the damage from attacks. The last fight in the Slowpoke Well is actually incredibly hard. A lot of my important Pokemon get poisoned from coughing on turns when Safeguard is down, and despite it hitting itself in confusion several times, its high defense stat keeps it around. Root gets KO'd while trying to land a supersonic and Brook is poisoned and too low, so it comes down to switching around and stalling until the coughing struggles and takes itself out. I feel pretty bad about letting Root get KO'd here, but I honestly should have leveled him up more, so this one's on me. However, the guilt is pretty short-lived. 
I decided pretty early on that I wasn't going to enforce Species Clause in this run, which is why I didn't mention it at the beginning. If you don't know, Species Clause just means that if I catch one Pokemon of a species, I can't catch that Pokemon again to increase the diversity of my encounters. But there really just aren't enough viable encounters at certain points in the game to actually use in a run like this. So if I lose a critical piece, I wanted the option to at least try to catch it again. I wouldn't call Zubat critical, but its quad resistance to bug type attack seemed really handy for Bugsy, so I catch another Zubat in the Slowpoke well and name it Route 2.0. Welcome to the team, Bubba. After grinding to the level cap and solving the spider puzzle I absolutely do not remember, I'm ready to take on Bugsy. Now, most normal gym leaders do not start off with their ace, but Bugsy isn't like other gym leaders. He's unique. He leads with his level 17 Scyther that is absolutely terrifying. It has Technician, so its quick attacks hit for a ton of damage. It has an insanely high attack stat for this early on in the game, allowing it to hit for massive chunks with U-turn, and it can focus energy to improve its chances of landing a critical hit and leer to lower our defenses. It's just a nightmare Pokemon all around. Thankfully, the other two Pokemon are mostly useless. I lead off with Code to get an Intimidate off, and then immediately switch into Greg and start spamming defense curls. I'm hoping this will convince the AI to click U-turn so I can push dealing with the Scyther down the road when Bugsy doesn't have other Pokemon to U-turn into. It works, and Bugsy U-turns into his Metapod. I poison it with Subscribe and switch out, not realizing that Metapod has Shed Skin. This is annoying, since I wanted to be in with Brook when the Scyther came back in, so I could set up Reflect on the turn before Metapod would go down. So I'm forced to go back into Subscribe just to keep reapplying the poison to the Metapod. This does get Bugsy to waste his Super Potion, but eventually the Metapod succumbs to the poison. Bugsy goes back into Scyther, so I switch into Code to get an Intimidate off. I then misclick and switch into Route 2.0 instead of Greg. This is a pretty bad mistake, since if Scyther attacks, it's likely to use Quick Attack since U-Turn is resisted by Code. It indeed goes for a Quick Attack and gets a critical hit. It takes my Zubat all the way down to 3 HP. Honestly, I'm just surprised that Root lived at all, so I'll take it. I correctly go out into Greg this time, hoping to coax another U-turn, but instead the Scyther goes for a Focus Energy and starts spamming Quick Attack. One eventually crits, and I decide to switch into Code to get another Intimidate off, but Scyther lands a crit Quick Attack on him as well. This is not good, and I'm pretty sure we're about to wipe. I go into Lunar here, who I haven't used a ton, and I'm gonna try and poison the Scyther, but instead it lands back-to-back -back Critical Hit Quick Attacks. I mean, I understand Focus Energy raises the Critical Hit chance to 25% in this game, but this is getting ridiculous. I decide to risk another attack and use Flash, at this point, I feel like I need to make a pretty risky play to have a shot, and accuracy strats can cheese wins from nowhere. I get off the flash, and then on the turn I click Poison Powder to actually poison the Scyther, it U-turns and gets a critical hit again. This kills Lunar. Sorry buddy. I know you didn't do a ton in this run, but you'll be missed. The Kakuna comes out, and since it's part poison, I have to resort to my confusion strategies. This takes a while, but it also gives me an opportunity to roost with Root, getting some health back. Kakuna goes down to hitting itself right as I set up a Reflect, which is as good as I could have hoped for, and it's just the Scyther now. I immediately switch into Subscribe to poison the Scyther because I know I don't have the resources left to waste a ton of time. The Scyther goes for Focus Energy on the Switch, which is both good and bad. It's good that Subscribe didn't have to take damage here, but it's terrible because critical hits can hit the Reflect. I click Poison Powder and thankfully the Scyther just leers. This RNG is really the best case scenario for me since Poison Powder lands and now I can switch safely. I predict a U-turn and go into Code to get the Intimidate off. Basically anything on my team will die to a critical hit U-turn at this point, so I figure this is a calculated risk that could pay off. But the Scyther just goes for leer again. Bugsy, you alright bro? I mean, I'm not complaining since this gives the poison time to stack up, but you really could be doing better dog. I switch into Greg who absolutely snacks on a quick attack but then takes way too much damage from a U-turn. I realize my Reflect has wore off now, and I'm worried again. I stay in and use Defense Curl, hoping I would be able to live another after my last defense boost, which works out, and I go to 4 HP, and now I have to switch or lose Greg. Scyther eats its Citrus Berry, recovering what feels like an insane amount of HP in this moment. Must be nice. Scyther seems locked into U-Turn, so I make the bold switch into Root, who absolutely swallows a U-Turn. I now have to worry about critical hit quick attacks, but since I've lived one before and I'm close to full health, I decide to risk it and go for a supersonic. It connects, and just like I planned, the Scyther hits itself in confusion on the next turn while I roost back up to full HP. I click roost again, thinking even if the Scyther does break through and crit me, I'll beat enough health to take a non-critical hit quick attack on the following turn, but the Scyther hits itself again and then falls to the poison. That battle was insanely hard, but we got through it with pretty minimal losses, and I'm super proud of myself for this one. Bugsy gives me some garbage TM, but I don't even care that it's useless because I feel pretty accomplished. As a secondary reward for winning, Brooke leveled up in the fight, so she evolves into a Ledian. I never thought this was a Pokemon I would use, but she's actually growing on me, and I'm kinda digging her. My feeling of accomplishment doesn't last long because I know I have a rival fight coming up, and after studying the fight, I'm close to positive I will have to pick a Pokemon to sacrifice. You see, our rival starts off with a Ghastly that loves to mean look and then curse. 
This strategy will almost always cost me a Pokemon and I don't have a ton of counterplay to it. I look at my options and decide that Root was born for this. Not Root 2.0, the original Root of Dunsparce I caught before the first gym. I thought it would be useful in this run, but after looking at its moves and realizing that its biggest asset was Glare, which Code already knows, I snap off the decision. I lead Root who immediately gets cursed and then mean looked. I could have switched to save it, but I didn't really want to risk any other members getting mean looked and then cursed. Root falls to the curse, then I bring in Root 2.0, who can roost off any chip damage and stall until the Ghastly uses curse again. It does, KOing itself, and the rest of the fight is pretty easy. Realistically, the Quilava probably should have been tough, but it only ever clicked smokescreen. Literally, it only clicked smokescreen. I'm not sure if our rival understands this game very well, but that makes sense because he's named after the 97% of people who aren't subscribed. Don't be like them. Getting the second badge opens up a ton of new tools and strategies for me. I make my way through Elix Forest and grab Headbutt, which actually unlocks some really good encounters. The first is a Pineco. I name it Drama, which seems like the perfect name for a Pokemon that is mostly known for exploding. I leave it in the box for now. It's not very good yet, but I have a feeling it will be crucial later in the game. You'll see. Headbutt also lets me encounter an Execute, which I name Mifa and gladly add to the team. Mifa is a godsend because our current level cap is 19, and while Hopip won't be able to learn Leech Seed before then, Eggy can. As a side note, Leech Seed is probably my favorite move in the game, so being able to incorporate those strategies into my game plan here has me excited. I spend some time grinding for levels to catch Mifa up, and Scream evolves into a Skip Loom during this. Now it's time to start grabbing some upgrades. I flip a ton of Voltorb until I can afford the TM for Substitute, which by my rules is now unlocked permanently. This is a great status move that plays into most of my strategies really well. I buy Protect from the Goldenrod department store, which is great for the same reasons, and then I head into the gym with what I consider a powered up team. The gym trainers are a breeze and I start the infamous Whitney fight. Most people regard this fight as one of the hardest in the franchise, specifically because of her mill tank. The Clefairy goes down easily after being seated and poisoned, while I can sit back and burn through turns with Protect and Substitute. The mill tank comes out and I switch into code for an Intimidate. Whitney goes for a stomp which does very little and I'm feeling good about this. I go for a glare because mill tank is holding a lumber and I would like to break that so I can land a poison powder later. Mill tank gets a critical hit stomp on this turn which takes me down to just 6 HP but code manages to hang on, doesn't flinch, and lands the glare. Super good job bud. I switch into Mifa eating a pretty weak stomp and set up the leech seed. This is great since mill tank has a fat HP stat my pokemon will now be healing a decent amount each turn, really increasing their survivability. I go out into Scream to poison the Miltank with Poison Powder, and then I just go straight into Greg who can sit in front of Miltank, eating all the hits while setting up Defense Curls. Eventually, the cow dies to the combination of Leech Seed and Poison. That was my most painless gym fight yet, and I'm really starting to feel like this run is doable with our new tools. With the third badge unlocked, I go start a fight with a tree, only to run from it because I honestly just don't care about this. And then some kid gives me Berry Pots because he liked watching me run from a tree. Pokemon is weird. I'm now under the impression that I can finally farm berries, which I can, but the joke's on me. I've been able to get berries since I beat Faulkner. I wouldn't have been able to farm them like I can now, but for those who don't know, which included me before this, in these games, berries don't really grow in the overworld. After you get the Rock Smash HM, you can just smash rocks for a chance at colored shards, which you can then trade to the juggler in Violet City for berry packs. So while it might have been slow and tedious, I've technically had access to berries for a while now. Anyway, I farm some shards, get one of each berry pack, and then use these berry pots with a little bit of completely legitimate time magic to farm up a ton of citrus, lum, and lepa berries, the ones that I think are most important. I'm starting to feel really good about this challenge with my new unlocks, and I'm ready to add some new team members. I catch a Vulpix on Route 36 and name her Copy. Vulpix gives me an entirely new damage source with Will-O-Wisp, which will not only burn opponents, but cut their physical attacks in half. This is such a great addition, and Flash Fire is also a great ability to pair with all my fire weak grass types. It also learns Roar, which will come in super clutch later for some different strategies. You'll see. I then move up to Route 37 and I catch a Stantler that I named Goldfish. Stantler will work as a secondary Intimidate Mon, and it also happens to learn Confuse Ray pretty soon, which will be miles better than Supersonic for any Confusion strats that I might need to do. I make some changes to the team, swapping out Code and Greg for Goldfish and Copy, and then I do a little bit of grinding to get my new members caught up, but I immediately hit my biggest roadblock yet. I'm starting to look at the Morty fight, and it honestly looks impossible to get through without wiping. In fact, it's not just Morty, it's his entire gym. All the gym traders are required battles, and including Morty, there are a total of 12 Pokemon that know the combination of Curse plus Mean Look. And as I've already demonstrated in Azalea Town, the combination of Curse plus Mean Look is a massive problem for my team. This normally isn't a big deal when you can directly attack and KO a Pokemon to break the Mean Look, but under my rules, every knockout takes time, and I would almost be guaranteed to lose all or most of my Pokemon. I honestly spent hours researching and trying to figure out a strategy, and just when I thought I might YOLO the gym, I stumbled upon my first answer. 
I had to fight 97% in the burn tower to even unlock the gym, and during this fight, I realized that Substitute completely blocks Mean Luck and Curse, a fact I did not know before this and something I couldn't find a concrete answer for by searching. As long as Scream could outpace the opponent and set up a Substitute, I wouldn't get locked in and I would be able to wear down any Pokemon with Leech Seed, which it is now learned. This was a great find. But the gym fights would still be problematic because the current level cap is 25 and Scream would be way over leveled by the time I made it to Morty. This also left me vulnerable to just getting cheesed by Mean Look plus Curse when I do have to switch. After this discovery, the rival battle was aggressively easy, and with the gym unlocked I really started to look for anything I could that would help. I remembered using an item called Shed Shell in competitive battles, and this was a massive breakthrough. Shed Shell is a held item that basically prevents any Pokemon holding it from being trapped by any means. It normally comes up in competitive battles when you don't want your Steel type trapped by a Magnet Pool Pokemon, but it also completely negates the effects of Mean Look. Where can you find Shed Shell and Heart Gold and Soul Silver, you might ask? Well, it's actually the consolation prize for losing the bug catching contest. I also happened to make this discovery while I was recording on a Tuesday, so the bug catching contest was live. Feeling like I just came up with a galaxy brain strategy, I made my way to the national park where I have not yet gotten an encounter. I entered the contest and caught the lowest level Weedle I could to hopefully lock in last place, and just like that, I was the proud owner of a Shed Shell. Game on. This single item turned Morty's gym from a nightmare into a much less scary nightmare. Still a nightmare because of ghost types, you know, but much more doable. I had two more upgrades I wanted to make before challenging the gym, and this is content I didn't even know existed in these games before this playthrough. In the Johto remakes, you can take part in a mini game called the Pokeathlon. I'm not really going to break down the games, but basically you play these mini games, farm points, and you can spend the points on prizes. Some of the prizes include evolution stones, and right now I'm using two Pokemon that require evolution stones to evolve. So I grinded out some random events, cashed in my points on two separate days for a Firestone and a Leaf Stone, evolved Mifa and Copy, giving me my first two fully evolved Pokemon, and now it's really game on. I moved the Shed Shell around to different Pokemon in between gym trainers to keep the experience gain relatively even, but the Shed Shell really made these fights pretty simple. Most fights would consist of a Gassier or Haunter using Mean Look Thin Curse, then me switching, and then them KOing themselves by using another curse. After performing exorcisms on all the other gym trainers, I challenge Morty and hope that all this prep work will pay off. I keep the Shed Shell on Scream since it's faster than Mifa and isn't weak to Shadow Ball and can shrug off chip damage more easily with Synthesis. I lead with Scream and immediately substitute and set up a Leech Seed to start wearing down the Ghastly. After it's low, I switch over to Goldfish, but Morty uses a Hyper Potion. In the moment, this terrifies me since Goldfish is now trapped in thanks to a mean look, but I manage to land a Hypnosis and the Ghastly stays asleep forever, letting the Leech Seed drain it out. Morty goes into his level 21 Haunter, which actually doesn't have mean look, so I confuse it and then switch to Brook to use Safeguard because this Haunter's main strategy is to use Hypnosis and then Dream Meteor or Nightmare to rack up damage. Brook gets put to sleep immediately, so I switch in a copy to try and burn it with Will-O-Wisp. Again, I get put to sleep immediately, but after a few turns of the Haunter hitting itself and landing one Dream Meteor, I wake up and burn it. It's on a clock now. I go back out into Brook even though she's asleep because I feel like I need to set up a safeguard, and eventually she wakes up and gets the safeguard off. I set up a light screen as the Haunter goes for Curse, then I switch into Scream knowing it's basically free since the Haunter can't do anything to me. It dies to its burn and out comes Gengar. I set up a sub to dodge the mean look and then I seed the Gengar. I keep waiting for Gengar to break my sub so I can switch into Goldfish since all Gengar can do to normal type Pokemon is put them to sleep or Sucker Punch, but I guess the AI doesn't know how to play against substitutes? I just keep going for Poison Powder knowing it will fail while the Gengar repeatedly tries to use Hypnosis, Mean Look, or Sucker Punch. Finally it went for a Shadow Ball so I switch into Goldfish and just watched it spin its wheels until it went down. After this Morty only has one Haunter left, but this one has Curse and Mean Look so I go back out into Scream on the Mean look, set up leech seeds, and just wait for the Haunter to curse. It finally does, prompting me to switch into Goldfish while Morty goes for his final Hyper Potion. I double back into Scream and substitute in Synthesis until the Haunter is under 50% and a curse will take it out. I go back into Goldfish one last time to confuse the Haunter, and eventually it falls to the seeds. I have to say, I'm actually really proud of this fight, because I legitimately thought this run was over after looking at it, but instead, it turned into one really intricate strategy game, and I enjoy that. With the fourth badge obtained, the map opens up a ton, which is kind of neat, but also kind of makes for odd level scaling. For instance, the next gym leader is Chuck in Cianwood City, which has a level cap of 31, but then the two gyms after that are Jasmine and Price, that have a level cap of 35 and 34 respectively. So the path that makes the most sense to keep under the level cap is to go take on Chuck, go all the way to Mahogany Town and deal with the Team Rocket drama, fight Price, then double back and fight Jasmine. 
Neat. I love going back and forth. To get to the next gym, I will need the ability to surf. So I go pick up the surf HM and go grab the good rod and head all the way back to Violet City to fish for a polywag. I don't really plan on using it for more than a water HM buddy, so I just name it Surf Please and move on. I head to Olivine City, and while on the way there, Scream evolves into Jumpluff, meaning this Pokemon is my absolute best substitute plus Leech Seed abuser now because of its speed. I scale the lighthouse, and after a few trainer battles, Code evolves. I've swapped Brook out for Code because while Brook provided a ton of utility, Code's Intimidate and Poison typing are too good to pass up for now. I reach the top and talk to Jasmine about her sick lamp puppy, and now I'm off to Cianwood City to get some juice to heal her sick lamp puppy with. On the way there, I catch a tentacle and I name it Duskseo, which I am 99% sure I'm mispronouncing. I then try to head to the Safari Zone, but it's blocked off, and to unlock it, guess what you have to do? You have to go give the medicine to the sick lamp puppy. So I surf all the way back to Olivine, cure the living light bulb, surf back to Cianwood, head to the Cliff Cave area, which is now unlocked, and thankfully encounter a Mischievous. The odds were not in my favor for this one, but this is the only Pokemon from the area that I think will be beneficial to my team. I name him Six, and I let him go to the PC. Mischievous is one of my favorite Pokemon, and even though it's not super useful right now, I'm honestly super stoked to use it since it opens up an entirely new strategy that I think will be particularly strong in this run. We'll find out later if I'm right. For now, I keep my team as is and I head to Chuck. Chuck's team looks relatively straightforward, and with two Intimidate Pokemon on the team, the fight honestly doesn't look very tough. I lead Jumpluff versus his Primate to set Seeds, which I manage to land before it goes for a double team. After that, I just alternate between Code and Goldfish to lower its attack, and then eventually out into Copy to land a Will-O-Wisp. Chuck uses a Hyper Potion, but it eventually falls with Mifa on the field behind a sub. I seed the Polyrath right away and put it to sleep, and then hit it with a double Intimidate again before going into Scream to get a Poison Powder off. I do some switching around until the Polyrath falls. This has 100% been the easiest battle so far. My team right now is just set up pretty well against fighting types. The fifth badge is mine, and I don't need to do too much before the next two gyms. I teach Route 2.0 Fly, which I just unlocked, and make my way to Mahogany Town. From here I go north to the Lake of Rage to calm down this giant red noodle who is very, very angry. This impresses the dragon guy from Gen 1, and he asks me to help him out, but when I show up, he is actively murdering people. He tells me these people are bad guys or something like that, so a point blank hyper beam was just justified. I guess I'm not really one to judge, so I decide to help him out anyway. The Rocket Hideout is pretty uneventful, but I do switch up the team event and both Duskseo and Drama evolve. I bench Scream, Subscribe, and Code for the two newly evolved Pokemon plus six, and I take on Price with a brand new strategy. While leveling up, Duskseo has learned Toxic Spikes and Drama has learned Spikes. And while these normally aren't great in standard trainer battles, my Ninetales already knows Roar. Earlier, I mentioned that Roar opened up an entirely new strategy for me, and this is what I was referring to. My plan is to set up hazards and keep roaring out Price's Pokemon to rack up Spikes damage. I think I think I'm being kind of brilliant here, but there are a few reasons you're about to see why this wasn't the best plan, or even a good plan for this battle. I start off the battle with Price by getting up two layers of Toxic Spikes, and then switching into Drama to get up three layers of Normal Spikes. I switch into Copy, and I start Roaring. The Dugong gets dragged out, taking 25%, and gets poisoned. This is when I realized this was not the best plan. After a bit of chip, the Dugong goes for rest. Yikes. That move single-handedly counters my entire strategy. Had I actually done some more research for this fight, I would have noticed that I already had the Taunt TM and Six can learn Taunt. It's too late now, so I just try to work with what I have. I get the Dugong super low after some Leech Seed plus Confusion turns, but Price uses a Hyper Potion as I roar it out. I thought the roar would be great on the off chance that he didn't heal and the Dugong would just die on the switch end, but that didn't work. The Pyloswine comes out, and I at least know my strategy will work here. It gets poison, and I immediately switch into Goldfish to lower its attack. I confuse it and spam Sand Attacks, and the Pyloswine falls pretty quickly, but not before getting a pretty massive Blizzard off on Goldfish. He lives, but he's low. The Dugong comes out, and I realize that the only way I'm going to be able to get around the rest spam with my team intact is to bank on Confusion Strats once again. I switch to Copy and Confuse the Dugong, and start Tail Whipping until it's at negative 6 defense. On a turn where Dugong is asleep and confused, I switch into Mifa to get a Leech Seed up, then it's back into Copy to keep it confused. The Dugong and Seal only know Ice-type attacks, which is why Copy can just sit in front of them. It takes a while, but the Dugong eventually goes down. The Seal comes out, and I set up for a similar strategy, but this time I use 6 to spite away some of the rest PP so the KO happens quicker. This battle was a little bit sloppy on my part, but with a strategy pivot in the middle of it, we get the Frosty Boy badge and move on. I fly back to Olivine, and after running a few calcs, I'm confident that this battle should be pretty easy. I put Scream back on the team in place of 6, and I give Drama the Shed Shell because as I mentioned when I got this item, they prevent Steel types from being trapped with Magnet Pool, which both of Jasmine's Magnemites have. I lead off with Drama, and I should be able to get two layers of Spikes up, which will allow me to abuse a Roar strategy later should I need to, but the Magnemite Thunder waves me on the first turn, and then gets a critical hit Thunderbolt while I'm fully paralyzed on the second turn. I live on 9, but Drama is pretty much done for for this battle. I switch into Mifa, substitute predicting a Thunder Wave, and then set up Leech Seeds. I put the Mag to sleep and switch into Copy, 
confuse it, and then roar it out when it is low. The next Magnemite is forced out onto the field, so I burn it while it goes for a Thunder Wave, but I'm holding a Lumberry, so I heal from the Paralysis. I switch into Code, since it's mostly here to intimidate Steelix, eat the next Thunder Wave, and then switch into Mipha. I get a Substitute up and seed the Magnemite. I swear the AI doesn't know what a Substitute does, because the Magnemite just tries to Thunder Wave, all while dying to its burn and seed damage. Jasmine sends out the next Magnemite, which goes down to two turns of Seed Chip, and then Steelix comes out. I land Leech Seed and then go into Code for the Intimidate. The Steelix gets a critical hit Iron Tail, but most of my Pokemon actually have a decent amount of defense EVs from early game Kakuna grinding, so we actually take it reasonably well. I don't want to risk another crit, so I switch into Goldfish for the double Intimidate party, and then it's out into Copy to Burn. I absolutely swallow a Rock Throw after a double Intimidate and Burn, and then I switch into Mipha and set up a sub that the Steelix never manages to break through. I had a close call with Drama there, but we win the fight obtaining the 7th badge, and now I feel like the easy part of the game is over. I start searching for Pokemon I have access to on the routes that I've unlocked that might be useful in upcoming battles, and I decide to head back to the Ruins of Alf and grab a Natu. I name it Dragonite, understanding this is going to be confusing, and then I let it go to the box for now. Natu and Zatu have pretty great learn sets, and I think we can get a ton of value out of them moving forward. The next part of the game is the Radio Tower Rocket Jamboree, and before we could even properly infiltrate the Radio Tower, 97% shows up and rats us out. Dog. Snitches get stitches. The Radio Tower actually ends up being pretty tame except for one fight. Admin Petrol has a team of 5 coughings and 1 wheezing. The wheezing knows explosion and only one of the coughings doesn't know self-destruct. They also all spam smokescreen to lower accuracy and sludge which can poison. I maneuver the fight pretty carefully, lowering each floating cancer risks attack with code and goldfish, negating sludge hits and snacking on booms with drama, getting chip damage with seeds and will-o'-wisp when it feels safe, and overall just keeping the team as healthy as possible. The fight is actually pretty scary, but we get out without any incidents. I completely forget there is a rival fight tucked into this part of the game, and I started accidentally. Even caught off guard, the fight goes relatively smooth considering I didn't have a plan for it at all. A few tense moments and crits, but nothing wild. 97% is just really bad. The rest of the battles for this part of the game are really reasonable. The poison types that would have given us trouble earlier are easy enough for Copy to take out with Will-O-Wisp, making her the MVP for this part of the game. We have one last gem badge to get, and the fight against Claire looks like an actual nightmare. Not a nightmare like Morty where I can find a niche item that completely invalidates what's going to beat my team, but instead, Claire's team is just made up of solid Pokemon with good movesets. No niche strategy will get around that, I just have to play tight. I do some of the grinding to get to the level cap, and while doing so, Dragonite evolves. I've decided that Zatu actually looks pretty good in the gym since it can set up a Lucky Charm so that Claire's Kingdra can't crit us, and I can use Wish and Tight Spots to keep members of my team healthy. I'm not entirely sure if I'll use it, but it seems like a neat piece of tech that might come up. I go ahead and box both of my Intimidate Mons for this battle because lowering attack stats doesn't seem like a huge priority here when most of Claire's offense is special. With my Mons at the level cap and the gym trainers decimated, I challenge Claire. The opening strategy is similar to Price, only this time I know that Claire doesn't have Rest Spam to throw a wrench in my plans. I lead Duskseo and start with an Attract, hoping it will save some damage while I set up Toxic Spikes. I get up two layers of Toxic Spikes and manage to have Gyarados immobilized by Love three turns in a row. Really decent RNG. I switch out into Drama to start setting up Spikes, but I quickly realize this probably wasn't the best time to do this since Dragon Rage puts me on a fast clock. I get one layer up and then I go out into Scream to put the Gyarados on a clock. Scream seeds and poisons the Gyarados, and when I know Claire will use a Hyper Potion, I switch into Drama, who can now alternate between Spikes and Protect to stay healthy. The Gyarados goes down, and since Drama is in play, this lures out a Dragonair with Fire Blast. I have to switch out since Drama always falls to this, so I switch into Duskseo for the Resist and the massive Special Defense stat. The Dragonair scores a burn and then immediately procs its Shed Skin to get rid of the poison. Great. I didn't even realize these had Shed Skin as their ability, so once again, I am under-researched and under-prepared. I switch into Mipha since the Dragonair should go for Dragon Pulse, and it does. Mipha takes a reasonable chunk, and then I go for Leech Seed. The Dragonair is 100% going to go for our Fire Blast here, but a quick calc tells me I should live this most of the time. The Fire Blast connects, and wow. Mipha lives on 4 health and lands a Leech Seed. This was a super close call, and a turn that could have gone so much worse. I switch back into Duskseo for the massive special defense stat, and I use a track to stall some turns. Duskseo is getting low, so for the last turn I switch out into Drama to absorb a Dragon Pulse. The first Dragonair falls, and Claire sends out her ace. Kingdra is a monster. It has good stats all around, and its ability Sniper boosts critical hit damage. That means if it lands a crit, whatever Pokemon it hits will likely die. At this point, Drama, Duskseo, and Mipha are all incredibly low, and Scream is only at half health. I don't have a ton of options here, so I switch into Dragonite and take a massive Hydro Pump. Another one will easily knock me out, so I roost in hopes that I can cheese a miss. I do not, and the second Hydro Pump takes me to 12 HP. The only thing keeping me positive in this moment is Kingdra is already on a clock because of the Toxic Spikes. If it were not for this, I think this probably would have been a wipe. 
I switch into Scream knowing I can't outheal the next Hydro Pump with Roost, but the Kingdra goes for Dragon Pulse. This was a super risky play either way, but thankfully the Dragon Pulse doesn't crit and we survive in the yellow. The Kingdra drops below half the end of the turn and eats its Citrus Berry. I click Synthesis and the Kingdra misses a Hydro Pump. I'm not sure why it goes for Hydro Pump over Dragon Pulse here, but I'll take it. This gives me an opening to go for Leech Seed, which misses, and the Kingdra goes for a Hyper Beam. In the moment, I'm terrified because I know I'm about to lose Scream, but Scream actually eats it up. I run a Calc and the only way Dragon Pulse or Hyper Beam do this little damage to my Jump Pluff is if it's a negative special attack nature. That's honestly super lucky for me, but we take those. The Kingdra goes down to Toxic on its recovery turn, and I misplay once again here by going for Leech Seed instead of Synthesis. One of these days I will learn. Claire sends out her final Pokemon, another Dragonair, which takes the Spikes chip and gets badly poisoned. This one doesn't have Fire Blast, so I'm free to stay in in Synthesis to get some health back. I recover as it goes for Dragon Pulse, and then I'm free to set up a Leech Seed as long as its next attack doesn't crit. I land the seeds and the Dragonair just uses Thunder Wave, but I have a Cherry Berry on screen for this exact moment. I switch out into Six, who also gets Thunder Waved, but another Cherry Berry cures this once again. I told you earlier in this run that Six unlocks an entirely new strategy for me, and knowing that Claire still has one of her full restores left, I decide it's time to show you. On the next turn I click Perish Song, meaning both Pokemon on the field will faint after three turns. Normally the AI will just switch on the turn their Pokemon would actually faint, but Six also has Mean Look, meaning I can Perish Song and then trap them in while switching out myself on the last turn. I stall some turns and when my Perish count would fall to zero, I switch back into Scream. We one last Dragon Pulse and the Dragonair faints. If you look at my team at the end of the battle, it has really gone through it. Basically all of my Pokemon are low, and this fight doesn't even look half as hard as the Lance battle we have ahead of us. I have my work cut out for me for sure. With the Dragon Girl badge under my belt, there are only a few things to take care of before the Elite Four. I quickly fight the Kimono Girls, which goes pretty smoothly, and then I go take on Lugia. I'm going to be 100% honest with you, I have no clue if this is required, but I just perished on the Lugia and switched to a massively underleveled Poliwag, which I assumed it would KO, but it never did, and the Lugia just goes down to some music some legendary. After this, I have a ton of upgrades that I want to make before the Elite Four, so I head back to Goldenrod City to buy the Reflect and Light Screen TMs, which honestly, I probably should have been using this entire time. Then I fly to Cianwood and smash rocks until I farmed up some heart scales, which are the currency needed to use the move relearner. I go there and have Drama relearn Toxic Spikes. With Drama having both Toxic and Regular Spikes, I can free up a slot on my team for more diversity. I also teach Drama Sandstorm in case I'm ever in a spot where it needs to be able to put out damage on its own. The roll compression that Drama offers for the Elite Four is honestly super invaluable. With the prep out of the way, I make my way to the Indigo Plateau and fight 97% one last time. And again, he's kind of a pushover. You've lost your touch since Azalea, bud. I do some final grinding to hit the level cap of 50, which is the equivalent to Lance's strongest Dragonite. I'm not really sure if people in Hardcore Nuzlocks go by the strongest Pokemon that the last Elite Four member has, or the Champion has. Either way, this challenge is hard enough, I'm just gonna match Lance's strongest Dragonite. I decided on a final team of Mifa, Scream, Six, Dragonite, Copy, and Drama. This leaves some glaring holes in my team, but I'm hoping the utility these Pokemon bring is enough to overcome that. Dragonite now knows both Reflect and Light Screen to offer support to the team, and I've taught Six Protect to help with Perish Song kills. I'm stocked up on Citrus, Leppa, and Lumberries, and it's time to jump in. Can I actually beat the Elite Four without attacking? Will is up first. He specializes in Psychic types and has some pretty good Pokemon, but I don't think they line up very well against my team. He leads with a Zatu, and I lead with Copy. I get off a of Burn and switch into Drama. The Zatu only has Psychic and U-Turn for damage, so I can use these turns to set up Spikes and Toxic Spikes. For whatever reason, this dumb bird went for me first five turns in a row while I got up all my Spikes. IDK dude, just AI things. On the turn I knew Will would full restore, I switch into Scream. I Leech Seed the bird and get confused, and then I switch into Dragonite on a U-Turn. Will goes into Jinx, which sounds terrifying, but its only Ice-type move is Ice Punch, which comes off as much worse physical attack stat. I set up a Reflect, and the Jinx just puts me to sleep with a Lovely Kiss. I go to Mifa, set up seeds, but get put to sleep right before the Jinx goes down. The bulk of this battle from here is wearing down the Zatu since they're the only Pokemon on Will's team not affected by my entry hazards. I eventually get the higher level Zatu seeded and poisoned and it goes down. The lower level Zatu is a bit harder to wear down because of U-Turn, but eventually I get it low with seeds even after making a pretty massive mistake of clicking Synthesis in front of it with Scream while Sand was up. Synthesis's base healing is affected by weather, and it's reduced in sand. Luckily I'm not punished here because Zatu didn't crit, and it's not exactly an offensive titan. It goes down and Will sends out his executor, so I match him by bringing out Mifa. 
Lucky his Eggie can't really touch mine, so I get up a substitute and just wait for it to die from Toxic. His last Pokemon is a Slowbro, which takes the spikes damage and gets poisoned upon switching in. I know that Will still has a full restore left, so from behind a sub, I click Leech Seeds, and then I immediately go out into six to click Parish Song. I don't really want to waste time here, so three turns later, the Slowbro dies to some music, and I'm starting to really wonder, just what is the Parish Song? It's so bad it kills you if you listen to it for three turns? Whatever, first Elite Four member down. Next up is Koga. He leads Ariados and I lead Copy. I burn the Ariados as it goes for a spider web. Normally this could be pretty bad since now I'm trapped and the Ariados can poison me with Poison Jab, but I have Roar so I can break out of the trap at any time. It actually poisons me from a weak Poison Jab on the next turn, but my Lumberry cures me. I wear it down with Confusion Strats, but it ends up in the red so Koga full restores. I try to wear it down again, but get poisoned. Time to roar. I can't really afford to lose any pieces until lands, so I have to play pretty tight here. He's forced out into Fortress, so I match with my own and we start trading hazards. Four out of my six Pokemon are immune to Toxic Spikes, and only one of his Pokemon is immune to my normal Spikes, so I'm okay with this trade. Eventually his Fortress goes boom for a little chunk of damage, and it's onto the Venomoth. I go into Dragonite, set up a Light Screen, and then switch into Scream, sub up to avoid a Toxic, and Leech Seed this Moth. After some switching around, I end up in with Dragonite as the Moth goes down so I can set up another Screen. Koga goes out into Muck, so I use a Reflect and eat a still surprisingly strong Gunk Shot. I Roost up, and then switch into Six. Muck doesn't really have anything to hit Six hard with, so so I go for the Parish Song as I get toxic. Six is actually holding the Shed Shell for this fight since I knew it was likely that I would have to use it to KO the spider without getting trapped by Spiderweb, so being poisoned isn't great. I stall a bit and Parish Song claims another KO. Koga goes into Crobat and uses Double Team as I switch into Mipha. Crobat has Wing Attack, but Calxay should always be able to live three, so I take this chance to set up Leech Seed which hits even through the Double Team. After some protection shenanigans, I put the Crobat to sleep and switch into Dragonite. I use Reflect to lower any damage and then pass a wish to Copy. This is a little risky, but Copy should always live a wing attack behind a Reflect. And this lets me get her close to full health. The Crobat goes down to Seeds, and it's just the Ariados. Once again, I know Koga has a full restore, so I switch into 6 to sing this spider its last lullaby. Koga hits me with a big oof, and then 3 turns later the spider is deaded. It feels like 6 is overperforming, and honestly, I'm fine with it because I love Mischievous. The next fight is Bruno, and this fight is kind of a breeze. Hitmontop can't hit 6 at all, so I just use Parish Song and Trap It, and that's that. The Onyx is weak as heck, so I get it seeded, set up a Reflect, and get Max Hazard stacked up on it. The Onyx eventually goes down to Seeds, then Hitmonchan comes in and gets super low, so I roar it out. Hitmonlee tries to kick a ghost and for some reason that kills it. The Hitmonchan comes back in and hangs on by a thread, but then hits itself because it wants to go out on its own terms. And Machamp goes down to a sad song. Not much to say here, Bruno seems like the obvious weak link in this Elite Four. The last Elite Four member is a real Karen. No seriously, her name is Karen. She's a dark type specialist, which actually seems pretty decent against my team, but I'm feeling unstoppable at this point, so let's see how this fight goes. She leads with Umbreon and I counter with Copy. Copy is the only Pokemon I have that can status the Umbreon without triggering Synchronize. So I Will-O-Wisp, and then I switch into Scream to set up Seeds. Umbreon is already not super strong, so its physical attacks are kind of pathetic after a burn. I decide to take advantage of this knowing she'll use a full restore when Umbreon gets low, and I switch to Drama to get full stacks of both spikes up, and then I just wait for Leech Seed to slowly take out the Umbreon. Karen goes into Houndoom since it should always easily be able to KO Drama, but Copy is the single reason I felt comfortable bringing so many fire weak Pokemon to the Elite Four. I switch in on the Flamethrower completely immune, and after a bit of switching around, I trick it into going for Flamethrower again on Drama as I switch into Copy and it goes down to Poison. Probably the biggest threat to my team, down. Karen goes into Gengar which has a really terrible moveset, so I burn it, go into Scream and seed it, and just wait for it to go down. Seriously, why does this not have Shadow Ball? Murkrow comes out next, so I seed it and poison it. It doesn't put up much of a fight and goes down shortly after. Karen's last Pokemon is Vileplume which sucks up my Toxic Spikes, but it's really not that big of a deal at this point. I can't poison it or seed it, so I go into 6 and sing at it. A few turns later, and I'm really thankful that I was able to snag a Mischievous. Parish Song has been so good for us. The Elite Four are defeated, but the next battle, the Champion Battle versus Lance, looks like potentially the most challenging thing I've ever done in Pokemon. My plan for Lance is tenuous at best, reckless at worst. I replace both Normal and Toxic Spikes on Drama for dual screens, because I feel like Drama will have an easier time setting them up than Dragonite, and Lance might be a Dragon Specialist, but secretly his type of choice is Flying. 
Not a single one of his Pokemon touches the ground, so spikes are useless. Stealth Rocks would have been massive here, but that TM is locked behind the Battle Frontier, which is inaccessible until after I beat Lance. Unfortunate. I make my final preparations and I challenge Lance. He leads off with a Gyarados that can absolutely roll my team, so I lead Drama and get a Reflect Up right away. Gyarados is going for Waterfalls, so I switch to Mifa to bait an Ice Fang, but I guess the AI detects Reflect and Gyarados just starts spamming Dragon Pulse. This is fine since now I can get it seated. I stall a little bit and then I switch back into Drama as Reflect ends so I can set it up again. The Gyarados drops down to the red and I know Lance will use a full restore here, so this is my shot to go into copy. I'll always live one waterfall behind a Reflect, so I click Will-O-Wisp and pray that I land it first try, which I do. Behind a Reflect and with Burn cutting Gyarados' attack, Waterfall does very little. I switch into Mifa and set up a sub and then protect as Gyarados goes down. Nice. One down, five to go. Lance goes into Charizard and this Pokemon is a massive threat to my team. I click Leech Seed from behind a sub and I really only have one shot to land this. Charizard breaks my sub with an Air Slash and thankfully the Leech Seed connects. I decide on going out to Dragonite to set up screens. I take a big Air Slash on the way in but stay above half and the Leech Seed recovery gives me a little wiggle room. I go for a Reflect expecting the Charizard to use Shadow Claw but it just Air Slashes again and gets a crit. Dragonite goes down and this is not good. I don't have a great answer to Charizard, and I just lost my only way to pass health around. Rest in peace, Dragonite. You were the newest member to the team, but I know you could have done so much more for us. I decide to go out into copy here because the Charizard is seated, and the best I can do in this spot is try and abuse some confusion hacks. I confuse the Charizard and start tail whipping to lower its defense, and amazingly, it hits itself in confusion three times in a row and goes down. That's incredible because honestly, I probably should have wiped to this thing. I'll chalk this one up to Karmic Justice. Lance goes into Aerodactyl and this Pokemon is also a massive threat to my team. It's almost like every single one of Lance's Pokemon is a massive threat. What a recurring theme we have here, huh? I switch into Drama and dodge a Rock Slide just as Reflect wears off. I know I need Reflect Up to do anything to this angry bird, so I set up a Reflect and then I switch into Mifa to get Seeds Go. I then go out and a copy on a predicted Aerial Ace and burn it. I can live a surprising amount of rock slides behind a reflect, and once burned, the damage will be laughable. I switch back into drama and sub up and protect a turn to secure the kill. Three down, three to go. With drama on the field, I will always lure in Lance's ace Dragonite since it has fire blast. So still behind a sub, I set up a light screen, then protect to stall a fire blast PP. I switch into copy to absorb the next hit, then go back into drama since this should lock the Dragonite into outrage. It does, and this lets me set up a reflect while the Dragonite cannot change attacks. The outrage ends, confusing Dragonite, and I switch into copy on a predicted fire blast while the drag hits itself. I land a Will-O-Wisp, but I'm still not feeling great about my position. I switch into Mifa while the Dragonite is still burned and confused, thinking it'll be able to live a fire blast since Light Screen is up, but this was not correct. Light Screen is not up, and Mifa dies to a fire blast. This one hurts a ton, because not only was this just a massive mistake on my end, but Mifa has put in so much work throughout this run, and I just let him down. No sugarcoating it, I wasn't paying close enough attention to my screen turns. I'm sorry Mifa, you deserved better. I'm in a bit of a pickle now, so I decide the best way to secure this kill is Parish Song. I go into 6 and serenade the Dragonite who just uses Safeguard. This play confuses me, but I'll super take it. I mean look on the next turn to trap and get hit with the Fire Blast. After protecting to stall a turn, I switch into Drama on a predicted Outrage, and instead Lance uses a full restore. Fantastic either way. Lance wastes a healing item, and I get in for free as Dragonite dies to singing. Lance goes into one of his two remaining Dragonites, and I have to assume it's the one with Thunder since the other one has Blizzard, which means all its attacks would be not very effective. I should barely live a Thunder here, so I go for a Reflect to weaken Dragon Rush, but Dragonite gets a crit, and Drama goes down. This death is also super sad for me. I really love the entry hazards that Drama provided and the strategies that came along with that. And honestly, all of these losses are really starting to put me on tilt. My only real shot here is to get this Dragonite seated, since 6 is at half health and Lance still has two full restores. So I go into Scream. I land a Leech Seed and get paralyzed for my efforts. This was also a misplay. I didn't know this at the time, but AI will almost always prioritize speed control if they have the option to. I could have freely set up a sub here, so once again, I am not in a super ideal situation and it is my own fault. I switch in a copy because I absolutely have to burn this in order to survive the onslaught of Dragon Rushes coming, and I land the Will-O-Wisp and Dragonite again paralyzes me. I really should have had substitute on all my Pokemon going into this fight. The Dragonite drops to the red, so knowing Lance will full restore, I go for a Willow again, but I miss. F's in the chat for that one. On the next turn, I dodge a Dragon Rush and land a Will-O-Wisp. 
Pogs in the chat for that one. After a few turns of Dragonite not once missing a thunder, it goes down. Copy is close to half health and paralyzed, Scream is paralyzed, and Six is close to half health. My team is beaten down, but we only have one Pokemon to go. I know I'll have to burn the Dragonite in order to perish song, and calcs look like I should be able to barely live a Dragon Rush here. I go for the Will-O-Wisp while getting hit down to just 12 HP. I break through paralysis and land the attack. Copy, you've done so much for me. I honestly think this run might have been impossible without you. I switch into Scream as the Dragonite misses another Dragon Rush. Scream is in a really tough spot versus this Dragonite. Had I subbed to dodge the paralysis, I could stall this Dragonite out of blizzards with protect plus substitute, but I'm paralyzed, so that's just not possible now. I know there isn't much Scream can do, and 6 is clearly my only win condition here. So I go for Leech Seed hoping for a miss, but Dragonite lands a blizzard and Scream goes down. This is so sad. Scream and Mipho were the backbone of this run since Leech Seed would keep my team healthy while I would wait for residual damage to stack up or Perish Song turns to pass. I'm sorry I let you get paralyzed, buddy. I know the only chance I have left is Perish Song, so I go out into 6 and sing my heart out. The Dragonite paralyzes me, which in this instance is probably better than attacking since I dodged the chance of a crit or a blizzard freeze for a turn. I protect as the parish count falls to 2. In my current spot, I only really have one option to make it out of this fight, and it's gonna hurt. I can't risk double protect, so I switch in a copy and she goes down to a blizzard. I hate that Lance hasn't even tried to miss any of these inaccurate attacks, but even more, I hate sacrificing copy because she really did so much for me. I send 6 back out, and as long as I don't get fully paralyzed here, I win. I click protect and I break through paralysis. Dragonite's Parish Count falls to zero, and I become the League Champion winning the run. Or have I? If you're a Pokemon fan, you know that the Johto games have eight more badges and another battle waiting at the end of the game that is perhaps one of the single hardest trainers to beat in any Pokemon game. My team is absolutely devastated. Six is the only surviving member, but I feel like I won't have actually won the challenge until I've beaten every aspect of it. I would have to form a completely new team, but if that's something you want to see, let me know. For now, I'll count this as a partial win because otherwise, my team losses are too sad to think about. In all seriousness though, I am incredibly proud of myself. When I started this challenge, I didn't even know if it was possible, and now I actually know that it is with some strategy and knowledge. This challenge forced me to play defensively for most of the run, and that's an interesting way to play the game that I think is often overlooked. At times, it made my battles reasonably safe since I was playing to win a slow game, and others, it left me incredibly vulnerable since my strategies all take several turns to accomplish. My losses in this battle against Lance were devastating, but most of them were preventable had I not made careless mistakes. I'm going to consider this a teachable moment and move forward having learned from those mistakes. If I try a challenge like this again, I might tweak the rules to make it a little bit more difficult. Maybe I could get rid of the encounter rerolls? I, I don't know, let me know what you think. If you enjoyed this video and you want to see more like it, please consider liking and subscribing. That kind of support helps out more than you know. I'm already working on my next challenge and I think it's going to be a fun one to share with you. You can follow me on Twitter or join my Discord to suggest future challenges or simply leave those ideas in the comments. Thank you so much for watching, but I'm kind of done here and I have to leave. Okay, see you next time. Bye.